Welcome to Your Heart's Desire, another podcast with my pals. Would you guys like to introduce yourselves? I'm Ideas of Ice and Fire. You can find me on YouTube and you can also find me on Patreon and Twitter. Thank you so much for having me on, Gray. I am the reformed and much less interruptive LML, who's grateful to be back again, Quinn. Thanks for, and Gray, thanks for having me back. We're sorry Tony couldn't be here, but he got abducted by Euron and he's now chained up somewhere on the silence in the middle of the ocean. So, <laughs> our bad. We are searching for him desperately with glass candles and we will attempt a rescue mission as soon as we can. The children of the forest have not been cooperative. <laughs> We miss you, Tony. The TV show Game of Thrones covers very little about the Valyrians and dragons. We know of the rise and fall of Valyria, and we know of ancient magic that was lost in the doom. We know of legends and Targaryens and the death of dragons, but maybe we should examine what we think we know. So I wanna talk about first the rebirth of dragons. On screen on the TV show, you see Daenerys walk into the flames with three petrified dragon eggs and a blood sacrifice. And it's just like, whoop, there it is. Three dragons. Voila, we did it. But what TV didn't show you are the dreams that she had leading up to the rebirth of dragons, what she saw in the flames. Also, in the show, the Red Comet seems to come into play after she birthed dragons. But the Red Comet came into sight before she stepped into the flames. She actually hailed the comet as a sign, and we're going to start here. So in the books, unlike the show, the comet shows up before the dragons are born. Danny sees it in the sky, and she takes it as a sign. She says, that's Drogo's uh, star, right? And throughout book one, Danny is getting all these dreams. She's having all these dreams. And my idea is that I think the dreams influenced her and eventually someone, some outside force basically told her how to do this ritual that led to the birth of the dragons, right? So it's kind of like at, at the end, she kind of has that final dream and then she knows her baby's dead. She she knows what she has to do. She knows that she has to sacrifice Miri. She knows that she has to put the eggs there. She knows that she has to walk onto the pyre. And then, What's interesting is what she sees while she's inside of the pyre. The flames were so beautiful. The loveliest thing she had ever seen. Each one a sorcerer, robed in yellow and orange and scarlet, swirling long smoky cloaks. She saw crimson fire lions and great yellow serpents and unicorns made of pale blue flame. She saw fish and foxes and monsters, wolves and bright birds and flowering trees, each more beautiful than the last. She saw a horse, a great gray stallion limed in smoke, its flowing mane a nimbus of blue flame. Yes, my love, my sun and stars, mount now, ride now. So that is the first part of what she sees after she steps into the flames. She's basically seeing visions in the flames like Melisandre. Yes, it's important to point out that she's seeing this, like that she's looking into the flames and, and what it appears to be is that the flames are forming these images of like these um, people in yellow and orange robes and uh, yellow serpents and fire lions. So we have to wonder, like, is what's happening to her right now similar to what happens to Melisandre, what she sees when she looks into the flames? Because if we go back to that chapter in A Dance with Dragons, uh, it's the flames actually forming the shape of what she's seeing, like it's appearing in the flames, which is quite similar to what's being described here. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a really good observation. I had always sort of interpreted it poetically because there's so much going on. The birthing of the dragons, all the sounds, her walking into the fire, and then she sees all these things in the fire and sort of just adds to the psychedelic nature of the event. But you're right, more specifically, if you think about it, it, it really is a match for Valerian sorcery or what we might call fire magic that Melisandre practices where she sees visions in the fire. Um, I guess I guess that is more properly, I don't know, I called it Valyrian sorcery. We don't actually hear of Valyrians peering straight into the fire and seeing visions, although I don't think it would surprise us if they did. It's only Melisandre that does that. The Valyrians were using glass candles, which I guess we'll talk about later, but you could take, this could be a foreshadowing that Danny will eventually be able to see visions in the fire like Melisandre. Um, I, I think, again, we'll talk about this later, but I think she's gonna get her hands on a glass candle 
and start to practice more magic. So perhaps that's being foreshadowed here. That's really cool. Now she thought, now. And for an instant, she glimpsed Khal Drogo before her, mounted on his smoky stallion, a flaming lash in his hand. He smiled, and the whip snaked down at the pyre hissing. She heard a crack, the sound of shattering stone. All right. So we, we have her seeing a vision of Khal Drogo. He has a whip and cracks the whip, and the egg, the first dragon egg, breaks open. All right. Now, I know LML wanted to talk about the symbology of this, so I'm going to let you say something. Well, Gray, what do you give your take on it first? What do you think of this? This well, vignette. Well, I don't, I don't have any myth, mythical references, but um, I do like the fact that she says cracking stone because I don't think the eggs are referenced that much as being stone. Hmm. And we know waking dragons from stone is a, hmm. a thing for Azora High. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Actually, that's, that's a great point. That's, it's literally the prophecy. Yeah, totally. So I've got on cue here, you, you mentioned, Gray, a second ago, the dreams that Danny has leading up to this event. And so when we're done with this scene, we'll talk about those dreams. And uh, there's another clue about it being a stone. What I think is cool is that um, the, the obviously, you know, the main part of my theory is that the uh, Azor High stabbing Nissa and Nissa with Lightbringer is a, a parallel metaphor for the idea of the sun you know look visually it looks like it's stabbing the moon with a comet basically it's a comet striking the moon but in the myth it talks about the moon wandering too close to the sun when it cracks and that means it's in an eclipse position where the moon looks like it's literally close to the sun and so if a comet strikes it in that position it's kind of like the sun striking his wife the moon with a comet Mm -hmm. And so that's basically what starts. It's symbolized in like five different ways in the scene. But when Drogo, that's your solar king, you know, her sun and stars, when he uses his fiery whip to crack open the dragon egg, then that's the, that's similar to the sun using a comet, a, a, a you know, a dragon comet or a, a fiery snake as comets are viewed as to crack open the moon. And so that's that really helps to describe the egg as a stone because it, it makes the comparison a little better. Like mm -hmm. in the myth, it says the moon was an egg, Khaleesi. And so it's easy to compare the dragon eggs to a, the moon, and it just makes it better when it's stone. So that's yeah. that's kind of what's going on. I guess to add on to that, you could also say the, the island of dragon stone is also a parallel symbol. It's literally a dragon stone, right? Just like mm -hmm. the dragon eggs are dragon stones. Mm -hmm. And if you go to dragon stone, what do you see? You see frozen dragons, uh, dragons that are locked in stone that look like they're about to wake almost. So it's yeah. kind of like a parallel symbol. I know Devils thinks that, wonders if these dragons can really come to life. Exactly. And there came a second crack, loud and sharp as thunder, and the smoke stirred and whirled around her and the pyre shifted, the logs exploding as the fire touched their secret hearts. She heard the screams of frightened horses and the voices of the Dothraki raised in shouts of fear and terror, and Sir Jorah calling her name and cursing. No, she wanted to shout at him. No, my good knight, do not fear for me. The fire is mine. I am Daenerys Stormborn, daughter of dragons, bride of dragons, mother of dragons. Don't you see? Don't you see? With a belt of flame and smoke that reached 30 feet into the sky, the pyre collapsed and came down around her. Unafraid, Danny stepped forward into the firestorm, calling to her children. The third crack was loud and sharp as the breaking of the world. I got the Ooh. chills. Such a good one. That, that's definitely a good one. LML, I think you should take it. <laughs> I'll try to be brief. I can't even, I don't even know how many times I've quoted this scene. So the whole idea, again, if the, if these eggs represent the moon, then, you know, the language like cracking as loud as thunder and then you know the breaking of the world i i think that's a reference to the hammer of the waters event which i be basically believe to be a mythological remembering of a moon meteor impact and if uh if a meteor of a certain amount of size were to hit on uh like an isthmus a peninsula of land 
it absolutely could cause massive land uh, collapse and stuff like that. And it could trigger earthquakes that could further the damage too. So it's somewhat practical and there's good clues laying around uh, the, uh, where the hammer of the waters fell, like the island named Bloodstone, like the Bloodstone Emperor, who's remembered as causing the long night, or the city called Sunspear. So when you start to think about fiery meteors that fall, that drank the fire of the sun, sound a lot like a sun spear so mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff like that but that's why i love that cracking of the world language but just set, just set aside all that stuff like this this event hatching of the dragons this is basically the first miracle of a song of ice and fire i guess brand coming back to life is kind of a miracle too but this is a, such a an amazing climax to the book you know ned has died just recently and drogo died and it's it almost it feels really heavy and depressing almost. And then we get this chapter and it's like the Immaculate Conception or something. I mean, it's just it's just phenomenal. Yeah. And I think George ends it with like that really good quote, like for the first time in a hundred in hundreds of years, the night came alive with music of dragons yeah. like that. He just ends it on such a good note. And I think like the cracking of the world I just feel like because these dragons have been reborn, like the world is about to be remade. Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. That, Cause you know, that's how I feel about Daenerys in general. But I want to say to you, LML, that I totally 100% agree that that line breaking of the world relates to the shattering of the arm of Dorn. And I've always thought so because it's like the same wording, the breaking of the world, right? So- What else could it be, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. but I never really understood what the connection might have been so that kind of that does really lead more credence to your moon meteorite theory yeah i'm that's this, i'm just now hearing that from from lmo <laughs> cool yeah I, I mean this this scene is where it started for me because the, the first uh, basically it was two key realizations i realized that when you hear a myth about you know dragons come from the moon the moon was like an egg and it wandered too close to the sun it cracked from the heat and dragons poured forth and they drank the fire of the sun and that's why dragons breathe flame. One day it just occurred to me that, well, of course, meteors and comets have often been described as dragons or fiery serpents in mythology. And if a moon were to crack somehow, what you'd get would be meteors, right? You'd get falling pieces of moon and those would be like fiery dragons. And I was like, holy shit, wait a minute. Falling meteors are exactly the kind of thing that could cause a prolonged winter and the darkness because of all the smoke and debris that they could throw up in the into the air. It's the same thing like a nuclear winter or a volcanic winter or an impact winter caused by a meteor strike are very similar because basically it's the same mechanism. They're clouding out the atmosphere with smoke and debris and the sun can't get through. So even during the day, it's like gray and dark purple and gloomy. And that's basically like, oh, I was like, that's a good mechanism for the long night. But then if you look at that myth, the moon wandering too close to the sun, Danny is replaying that here at this bonfire because Drogo is Danny's sun and stars, and Danny is the moon of Drogo's life. And so here's Drogo's bonfire, literally the fire of her sun and stars, and she wanders too close to it. And that is the exact moment when her dragon eggs crack from the heat and dragons are born. So she's mimicking that entire myth here in this scene. And so putting that together was basically the beginning of my theory. So I've nicknamed this scene the alchemical wedding of Daenerys Targaryen <laughs> because she looks at it like a wedding when she sees those fiery dancers we were talking about. She she's like, this is like a wedding. It's more beautiful than the dancers at my wedding. This is another kind of wedding. And it's, it's kind of an alchemical wedding because it's all about transformation. Here. Yeah. I think that character as a whole is all about tra transformation and change. Like I feel, I, I talked in the lad po last podcast we did actually about Daenerys and how I feel like she's kind of just the divine feminine spirit. That's what she's supposed to, re to represent. You now because yeah. she's there to change things rapidly, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think I've heard you refer to her as a god on earth. I mean- Or I, she's I, like a god. Yeah, I feel I, I have no doubt that like like a thousand years from this point, 
people will worship Daenerys Targaryen. That'll be a holy name. Like this is the Misa. Like this is this is the woman came, that came and brought back dragons to the world and like saved all these slaves and stuff like that. So no she doubt. Be like the new age maiden of light. Something like that. Yeah. Light. yeah, she's creating she's creating legends. You know, exactly. As she, as she goes. Exactly. The character is a legend. But I think it's cool to um talk about the behavior of the dragons after they're born too, because they're suckling on her breast, which are obviously full of milk because she was pregnant, right? And um, we know that dragons eat meat, but this is like kind of the only example that we have of them. Yeah, it's kind of symbolic. On breast, right? Yeah, because yeah, she's the mother of dragons and all that. But like, um, does that add any creep? Does that like? I think this is kind of also hinting at the fact that Daenerys has literal dragon's blood in her. You know what I'm saying? Because the dragons recognize her breast as like a source of nutrients, I guess. And I guess we don't even, do we even know if like dragons do that to other dragons? Like do dragons suckle at the mother dragons? No, we don't. Breast? We don't know shit about that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think it's yeah. interesting that the dragons go to her breast and she's a human. That just seems like if she was, seems a yeah. little odd. Yeah. Because like when you have kids, like they do it naturally, mm -hmm. mother to child, they just like latch on for lack of a better word. But, but yeah, that is kind of weird that they do do that. It's pretty clear that the bonding process between a dragon and the dragon rider begins before the dragon is born. That's like uh, because they said the Targaryens would have the kids sleep with the eggs right before the eggs even hatched. And that's what Daenerys did. Right. She kind of incubated them before that final yeah. moment where she hatched them. That's so. a perfect uh, transition actually into the dreams that she had leading up to this miracle and just to build on what you're saying about Daenerys being sort of like the closest thing to a god on earth if you will or becoming that like this George has even said like this thing where she walked into the fire and stuff this was a miracle event it wasn't necessarily repeatable it was you know this is not usually how dragons are born and Danny didn't know exactly what she was doing kind of going on instinct kind of going on this these dreams that she had and you know it really is beautiful how it's uh, George leads up to it so one of the most important dreams comes when uh, Danny is really struggling with the Kalasar and this dream acts as a turning point and, and so I'll read it uh, right here it says day followed day and night followed night until Danny knew she could not endure a moment longer she would kill herself rather than go on she decided one night yet when she slept that night she dreamt the dragon dream again the series was not in it this time there was only her and the dragon. Its scales were black as night, wet and slick with blood. Her blood, Danny sensed. Its eyes were pools of molten magma, and when it opened its mouth, the flame came roaring out in a hot jet. She could hear it singing to her. She opened her arms to the fire, embraced it, let it swallow her whole, let it cleanse her and temper her and scour her clean. She could feel the flesh sear and blacken and slough away. She could feel her blood boil and turn to steam, and yet there was no pain. She felt strong and new and fierce. And the next day, strangely, she did not seem to hurt quite so much. It was as if the gods had heard her and taken pity. Even her handmaidens noticed the change. Khaleesi, Jiki said, what is wrong? Are you sick? I was, she answered, standing over the dragon's eggs that Illyrio had given her when she wed. She touched one, the largest of the three, running her hand lightly over the shell. Black and scarlet, she thought, like the dragon in my dream. The stone felt strangely warm beneath her fingers, or was she still dreaming? She pulled her hand back nervously. From that hour onward, each day was easier than the one before it. Her legs grew stronger, the blisters burst, and her hands grew calloused. Her soft thighs toughened, supple as leather. One of um, three dreams. How many dreams does she have in, in uh, Game of Thrones? There's at least three, yeah. There's That's there's one of three, so it, it's, it goes from if I believe it goes from like an encouraging dream to a discouraging to a discouraging dream that makes her like really scared. And then there's one dream that kind of seems like there's like two different kind of things pulling on her. One that's saying, wake the dragon, wake the dragon. And then there's the icy breath on the back of her throat that she's afraid of. Okay, right? so that is that is the quote, wake the dragon dream that comes during her miscarriage with Rego. Mm -hmm. And that's the last dream she has before she does the the 
the actual waking of the dragons. This mm -hmm. is her second dragon dream. The first one was terrifying, and mm -hmm. it involved a series sort of te uh, te uh, teasing her. We can pull it Don't up in a second. Don't want to wake the dragon is what Right. It is. Th this is the second one. That's why it says Viserys is not in it. And the thing that changes about this one is that this is where she starts to draw strength from it. Uh, the dragon burns her with fire, but it's good for her. And so this is where she gets the idea that she can walk into the fire and that she can withstand fire and the fire is actually her friend and it makes her strong. And that's exactly what she does is walk into the fire and become transformed and reborn and stronger from it. And then obviously this is Drogon, you know, who's like her dragon. And it's that's why it's uh, wet and slick with her own blood. It's almost like she's just birthed it yeah. and it's got her blood on it. That's the way I read it anyways. Mm -hmm. I do. I read it the same. I okay. pretty much agree. And then she gets out and it begins this thing about her touching the eggs and like they feel warm. And there's another one where she feels it like twist and like reach out for her or reach out for the baby in her womb. Yeah, like they're that's... reaching out to each other. So you can definitely see in retrospect a lot of things foreshadowed here. Her walking into the pyre, her waking the egg, um, drawing strength from the pyre, and it actually transforms her arc in the Dothraki Sea and she begins to take control of her relationship with Drogo. So it's a totally transformative event and it's really important to her character. Absolutely. One of the, um, one of the quotes that I really draw from is where she sees Ser Jorah, um, or she doesn't see Ser Jorah. She sees Rhaegar mounted on a stallion and he has fire in his eyes, like he's in armor. And mm -hmm. then like, I think Ser Jorah tells her something like- That's the way the, the last, dragon dream the too, yeah. dragon. And um, when she lifts the visor, she sees her face. Yeah, that's the uh, Wake the Dragon Dream too. Mm -hmm. That one's got like six different scenes in it. Yeah, that's that's like to me that like everything that occurred in that dream after the Black Dragon Dream is what led her to know everything that she had to do. And saw her brother Rhaegar mounted on a stallion as black as his armor. Fire glimmered through the narrow eye slit of his helm. The last dragon, Jorah's voice whispered faintly, the last, the last. Danny lifted his polished black visor. The face within was her own. And then it says, after that, for a long time, there was only pain, the fire within her, and the whisperings of stars. And this is the very first line that I was talking about that begins to insinuate Quaithe influence. Yeah, the whisperings of stars. And then when you have Quaithe, you have all these starlight, masks of starlight, yeah, so I, I I I see where you're going with that connection. We'll get to Quaid later, but just remember that line. I mean, that's yeah. uh yeah. From reading those those dream those dreams in A Game of Thrones, like I, I get the impression that there's kind of two opposing forces working on Daenerys. I feel like there's one that's encouraging and there's one that's discouraging as far as waking the dragon, and eventually the one that wants her to wake the dragon uh, wins, right? And I feel like. The other one is represented through that icy breath on the back of her neck. Because when you see her in that first dream chapter, it's Viserys, and he's saying, you don't want to wake the dragon, do you? Don't do oh, it. That's right? interesting. That's oh, interesting. Yeah, I like sure. that. He's saying, so, don't wake the dragon. So do you think, um, well, we know you can get sent dreams through a glass candle, and then you can get sent dreams through the weirwood. Weirwoods. Icy breath. I mean, right. and I mean, I don't, I don't know if how far the influence of a werewood can reach right and I, if it was someone using the werewood net right it makes sense why um the other side would win over because daenerys is obviously very far away from the werewood net yeah i think they can reach pretty far because when yeah. bran when bran has his uh coma dream he sees a shot everything. he sees everything yeah but i i i i do think that it does have something to do with proximity right so, uh, Quinn, you're, so, you're sort of skipping over, I guess we, we talked pre-show a little bit, and so you're sort of skipping over the main thing. You have a theory that essentially all these dreams that Danny's having in A Game of Thrones are from Quaid, right? Yes. At least okay. she's, yeah, she's she's a big part of the dreams. And then there's, there's another side of this 
a, a figure that's not necessarily identified. It could be a Blood Raven. It could be like a ton of other people, I guess. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm-hmm. But Quaith, but Quaith, Quaith is, is definitely there, there. there, and she, she, and she doesn't appear to Danny. She doesn't start appearing to Danny like as Quaith until after Danny actually meets her, right? Right. Yes. So yeah. But do you think that Quaith is acting like on the behalf of someone else or yes. something else greater? Absolutely. I, 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 I don't think Quaith is just acting on her own. I think she's part of something much larger. I think this is all yeah. part of something much larger. Yeah, yeah. Which would be what? Um, I, it could be the Church of the Starry Wisdom, as we have suggested in the past. Uh, yeah. But we don't. We but the the what's really interesting though is like what we don't know is like what is their goal is that, and that and that's kind of the thing that I think we're most interested in figuring out like what exactly do they want if they do if they were encouraging Danny to hatch dragons and to do this then why? why yeah <laughs> why so here's an interesting com- uh, comparison between the philosophy of Quave and Melisandre Melisandre is fighting for the triumph of light and fire over darkness okay she wants the summer that will never end which in a yin yang sense is very wrong and bad you know what the good thing is balance that's why george's ultimate deity is the lord of harmony on nath he's literally the lord of harmony and that's harmony is the good thing right the balance of ice and fire the balance of black and white yin and yang etc cetera, etc cetera. so quave on the other hand her advice sounds a lot more yin and yang she's like to reach the light you must pass beneath the shadow she's sort of saying like you've got to embrace a certain amount of darkness in order to create the light you know it's it's creepy and i'm not saying quave is definitely benevolent but it's an interesting contrast to melisandre uh, Quaith sounds to be more along the lines of understanding a balance. So I consider Quay's knowledge to be greater than Melisandre's. And I I kind of am inclined to think that Danny is going to have to trust Quaith to some extent. See, the thing about Quaith, if Quaith is worshipping at the Starry Wisdom, I think that the people that worship at the Starry Wisdom, they worship the Bloodstone Emperor, right? Or well, they, the, it says that the Bloodstone like, Emperor founded the Church of Starry Wisdom. He was the first high priest. And he's not a good person. Well, he, no. He usurped the the Amethyst Empress. So do you think they want her to wake the dragon so they can usurp her? Because I know so you that, have an interesting theory about Daenerys being the Amethyst Empress reborn. Yeah, well, shout out to my buddy Duran Durandon. Uh, but yeah, so uh, the, Dan, in the same sense that uh, Euron seems like a Bloodstone Emperor reborn, uh, Danny fits very much as an Amethyst Empress reborn. And Euron is the one who describes Danny as having eyes of Amethyst, uh, the only one in the book that does that. Okay. So I definitely have worried about, uh, you know, why does Euron want Daenerys? Perhaps he wants Daenerys so that he can use her as a Nissa Nissa, uh, who might be the same person as the Amethyst Empress. If you, my whole theory is that Azor High is a bad guy, and that's the same as the Bloodstone Emperor. And when he killed Amethyst Empress, that's the same as him killing Nissa Nissa. Uh, but if they're not the same people, then it could be parallel events. Point being. Euron might be looking for Danny to use as a sacrifice, just as you suggest. It's possible Quaithe has something similar in mind, um, you know, but it's hard to say. In a, in a Song of Ice and Fire, if the Church of the Star Wisdom is still active and they had like a singular like place of business, where do you think it would be? Because I have an idea. I think it... Well, it's, it's, it says it thrives in port cities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we know it's a sailor's religion because sailors uh, use astronomy and have always tended to like a, a stra- astrologically based religions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if there's Old Town is a candidate, uh, I would have to say, if it's not, you know, a shy proper. I had the weird idea that it was actually Stagai, right? Ooh. In the heart of darkness. Because when Quaith introduces herself to Daenerys, she says, I am Quaith of the Shadow. All right, she's not like I'm Quaith from a Shy, I'm Quaith of the Shadow. And the Shadow is something different from a Shy. Like a Shy is part of the Shadow Lands, but like. Yeah, it's, it's, a, sh- it's a Shy by the Shadow. You yeah, know, Stig Eye is the heart of the Shadow. Exactly. And I always then, think about that as like the Mecca. Mm-hmm. So, the and then, 
if it was Quaithe in Daenerys' dream encouraging her to wake dragons, and she's saying she's from the Shadow, the Valyrians, according to the World of Ice and Fire, one of the legends is that they were, and according to the Annals of Ashai, they were taught how to tame dragons and magic by people from the Shadow. So, Quaithe is from the Shadow, people from the Shadow taught the Valyrians how to tame dragons and magic in the first place. And Quaithe's whole thing is that she's hinting to Danny that there's some sort of truth, truth in a shy that's waiting for her, you know. And what could it be? It could only be about dragons or Zor High or the Long Night or Lightbringer or some bullshit like that, right? Yeah. Ever since Book One, we've been getting hints that the origin of dragons comes from a shy. Uh, when Bran has his coma dream vision, he sees dragons stirring beneath the sunrise by a shy right before he looks to the heart of winter which even implies the shy and the shadow as an opposite to the heart of winter, which both Queen and I subscribe to that idea. Oh yeah. Check out my video, yeah. um, the heart of darkness, but continue. I'll yeah, no, it. absolutely. Plug away. Ideas of ice and fire YouTube channel. Heart I'll of link it. It'll be there linked in the description box. Any theories that we mention, any videos that we reference will be in the description box. So then Illyrio says that his dragon's eggs come from a shy and whether or not he's honest about that, um, you know, it's a shy is the place where dragon's eggs are thought of to have come from. It's the believable lie to tell, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the place where if they didn't come from Valyria, then a shy is the other place. So, um, and then there's uh, also Danny uh, recalls when she's talking about how there's no magic in the world, she sort of muses to herself that she's heard that maybe there's still dragons in a shy or something along those lines. So there's like four different hints in a Game of Thrones about Ashai and dragons. And then in the world of ice and fire is where that bit that Quinn is talking about, where one of the maesters is saying that um, potentially uh, the you know men from the shadow first taught the Valyrians how to tame dragons before they disappeared from the annals. So that sort of really, really fuels the fire of tying dragons to Ashai and specifically dragons that predate Valyria. Um, but then there's a whole other line of evidence. And let me take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> we hear about this thing called the Great Empire of the Dawn in the World of Ice and Fire. And it's this lost, fabled civilization. It's recorded in the myth of Yi Ti. And Yi Ti is a very large empire. It's one of the oldest uh, civilizations in the world. It seems to have arisen just after the Long Night around the same time as Gis and Sarnor, followed shortly by Valeria. That's the accepted history of the world anyways. However, Yi Ti, they follow after the Great Empire of the Dawn as ancestors, essentially. And they record this Great Empire of the Dawn as very much like an Atlantis, you know, fabled lost civilization. They were supposedly more powerful and more advanced. And they, you know, there was they were relatively free of the evils of the world. So, you know, the first emperor was the god emperor who descended from heaven. And it just sounds like your stereotypical fabled civilization. And the important thing about it is that it died during the long night. The Amethyst Empress was the last legitimate ruler of the great empire of the dawn. And according to this legend, this bloodstone emperor guy usurped the Amethyst Empress. It was called the blood betrayal. And for some reason that was so evil that it literally, they say it caused the Maiden Maid of Light, who is their name for the sun, to turn her back and hide from the world. And the long night fell, and the Lion of Night, who's their death god, kind of ravaged the earth. And the Bloodstone Emperor ruled this reign of darkness, slavery, necromancy, torture, all the bad shit. My favorite part, he worshipped a black meteor that fell from the sky, very much a Lovecraft kind of idea. And then that story ends with Azor High coming along and using Lightbringer. And it does, it's very vague. It just says, you know, the warriors of light were able to win the great battle against the darkness led by Azor High and Lightbringer. And, you know, peace and light returned to the world, but the world was a broken place and the Great Empire of the Dawn did not reform. So that's the legend of the Great Empire of the Dawn. The thing is that they seem to be the same people as the people who, who the ancient Ashai, if you will, the people who built Ashai. And the reason we know that is the dream 
And Gray, this is what you wanted to talk about. Danny's dream. It's the last part of the Wake the Dragon dream. Ghosts lined the hallway, dressed in the faded raiment of kings. In their hands were swords of pale fire. They had hair of silver and hair of gold and hair of platinum white. And their eyes were opal and amethyst, tourmaline and jade. Faster, they cried. Faster, faster. She raced, her feet melting the stone wherever they touched. Faster, the ghost cried as one, and she screamed and threw herself forward. A great knife of pain ripped down her back, and she felt her skin tear open and smelled the stench of burning blood and saw the shadow of wings. And Daenerys Targaryen flew. So most people have always interpreted this as basically Danny is seeing her ancestors, right? Because they've got hair of silver and gold and platinum white. That's the exact description of Valerian hair. Um, you know, each Valerian or Targaryen might lean one way or the other. But in the important part of the world of ice and fire, when they describe the Valerians as a whole, it's silver, gold, and platinum white. Those three exactly. So then we see these people, they've got swords of pale fire. That makes us think of Lightbringer. And they have Valerian hair. That makes us think, okay, so this is all about Lightbringer and these are Danny's ancestors. And we don't really have time to think about it because the next thing that happens is Danny like sprouts wings and turns into a dragon and then wakes up and Rago is dead and she's in the tent and the story is going crazy. And so it's not a lot of thought given to this. But like I said, in the world of Ice and Fire, we get this whole story about the Great Empire of the Dawn. The Great Empire of the Dawn has eight listed rulers and they're called the Gemstone Emperors because they're each named after a gemstone. And here are the eight gemstones. Pearl, the Pearl Emperor, Jade Emperor, Tourmaline Emperor, Onyx Emperor, Topaz, Opal, Amethyst Empress, and then the Bloodstone Emperor. The thing is, four of those stones are the same stones that we just saw in the eyes of these ghosts. Opal, Amethyst, Tourmaline, and Jade. And so, we were already looking at this great empire of the dawn, we being like me and my friends on westeros.org. When the World of Ice and Fire came out, we read that story and we immediately suspected them as potentially dragon lords or the people that built a shy. And then my buddy Duran Duran didn't notice this quote. He's like, wait a minute, those are four of the same gemstones and they've got Valyrian hair. So the one with amethyst eyes looks like a Valyrian, right? Purple eyes, Valyrian hair. But the other ones have, you know, I guess jade would be green eyes. Tourmaline can be a million colors. Opal would be some white kind of pearlescent kind of looking thing. But the important thing is that this allows us to connect Danny's ancestors further back from Valeria all the way to the Great Empire of the Dawn. And what did we just say? Separately, the Maesters told us that the ancestors of Valeria might come from a shy. So you can see how this all comes together. The Great Empire of the Dawn and the ancient Ashai are the same people. They were dragon lords. That's why they built the five forts out of few stone. And that's why Azor High and all the stuff goes back to Ashai. Yeah, and Ashai is like incredibly huge for it to just be... Largest city in the world. Yeah. It's Old crazy. Town, King's Landing, and... Old Town, King's Landing, and something else can fit inside right. of it. And, and yet the population is that of a fair-sized market town. So it's basically a bunch of shadowbinders and people like Marwyn the Mage and Miri Mazdor that come there to learn dark magic and then their servants and pack mules, and that's like it. Actually, not even pack mules, because animals die there, so everyone uh, travels by palanquin. So I guess it's the servants holding up the palanquins and then a bunch of sorcerers. But it's this huge city, like you said. So logic dictates that when it was built, it must have housed a lot of people, right? Because you don't build giant cities just so like a few hundred sorcerers have a place to study magic by the shadow, right? Yeah. And I also think, um, I don't know if we already read this quote, I can't remember, but there's a quote that ties Daenerys directly to the Amethyst, the, um, yeah, to Euron, her ancestors. Well, Euron says that uh, when he's describing Danny to Victarion, he says her eyes are amethyst and she's the most beautiful woman in the world. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that. Because that like completely sells it for me. It does, yeah. Because Euron is like the Bloodstone Emperor trying to become a god on Earth. He even says that in that uh, Forsaken chapter. I am your, I am the new god and the gods, the old gods are dying and the world is changing. And 
So yeah, it makes sense when he calls Danny amethyst eyed. It's almost like Euron probably sees her as an amethyst empress, potentially to sacrifice, like I was saying, to work magic or something. And uh, yeah, I, so. and I don't think any, I don't think amethyst is used to describe any other Targaryen's eyes or no. any anyone's no. eyes. Mm -mm, just Danny. You're right. And this one uh, vision. So the point of all that, besides being interesting, is simply that the Valerian history goes back to Ashai. And that's kind of an intuitive thing that's spelled out to us from the beginning in a lot of different ways. So the Great Empire of the Dawn Theory is fun, and it brings in those swords of pale fire and stuff. But, you know, we're here talking about Valerians and dragons. And the important thing is that the roots of everything from Valeria go back to Ashai and Lightbringer and to Zor Ahai. Uh, because Valerian Steel is very comparable to the forging of Lightbringer. And that's another thing that we had slated to talk about. Whew. And I think it's important that everyone that's listening gets the complete backstory of what could be going on or what we think is going on that you don't get to see on TV. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this all informs, uh, you know, what Danny is doing and why the whole Azor High and Lightbringer stuff has something to do with dragons uh, and a shy. I mean, it, it's all going to sort of tie together. And I think that's that's the truth that book Danny, at least, will be realizing. Um, you know, even, you know, show Danny, it's hard to say, like, will she be getting any further knowledge or magical instruction next season? Or will it all just be like politics and fighting the others? It's hard to say. <laughs> politics. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Never mind. Well, so the important thing is we kept talking about Starry Wisdom Church, uh, and this this whole theory is kind of what ties it together because the Bloodstone Emperor was said to be the first high priest of the Church of Starry Wisdom, and he basically founded the Church of Starry Wisdom. He's also the guy that brought on the Long Night. So, and and if uh, if that's all connected to a shy, then it sort of really starts to make sense why Quave keeps uh, showing signs of being from the Church of Starry Wisdom and why the Church of Starry Wisdom is more than just a trivia nod to Lovecraft, but it's actually important. Like the people that are trying to control Danny, like Quinn was saying, are potentially being influenced by this Church of Starry Wisdom, which dates back to the Bloodstone Emperor. I mean, yeah. and we could talk for days about the parallels between the Bloodstone Emperor and Euron, right? I mean, both characters are just steeped in a bunch of Lovecraftian influences. It's all all the way around. Both of them is just surrounded by it, and then Blood Eye sounds an awful lot like Bloodstone, right? Because Euron has his Blood Eye, which he shows to the world in that vision, right? He wants to become a god. Uh, yeah, it's it's there in the uh, Forsaken chapter. Um, Aaron says that Euron is showing the world his Blood Eye, and it's terrible. And, and you know they say that people that have looked have seen Euron's eye in the past have just pointed out how horrible it is. And mm -hmm. um, the bloodstone, like the stone that uh, the bloodstone ember worshipped, it is a direct Lovecraftian reference, right? Like a stone falls from the sky and it kind of drives you mad, and it does all this stuff, right? So it just it just all seems very similar, well, right? And, and since Danny saw the gemstone, uh, she saw the gemstones of the gemstone emperors in the eyes yeah. of those mm -hmm. ghosts. It, you, it implies a Bloodstone Emperor as having an eye that looks like Bloodstone. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, so calling Euron's blood eye, comparing it to the Bloodstone, is very uh, is very apt. And also, I would like to point out that a bleeding star is a bloody stone because it's a flying stone that looks like it's bleeding. So he worships a bleeding star, and his name is Bloodstone. It's kind of all of a piece. Yeah, so, uh, and the Bloodstone Emperor, he was not a good person. Like, he tortured people, he practiced dark arts, and... Euron is currently doing all of that stuff. Necromancy. <laughs> at the same time, though, look at the rumors that are spreading about Danny. They mm -hmm. sound like a Bloodstone Emperor, that she bathes in blood and sacrifices people and tur dragons and, like... Oh, yeah, you know, that's, that's true. That's all. So, it's hard to say. The Bloodstone Emperor is a Lucifer Prometheus character. He yes. is someone who is stealing the power of the gods and challenging the gods and throwing up and throwing off the natural order. And those figures are always controversial and they're always ones that can be seen as, you know, anti-heroes or 
part good and bad or you know reaching for the fire of the gods can be good or bad but it always has consequences so it's it's complex yeah i mean okay so we i, I feel like uh, in general people are aware of milton's paradise lost which is kind of like another take on like the biblical genesis story right but it's kind of from lucifer's point of view right so he essentially he climbs into the garden of eden and he gives man and woman the knowledge of good and evil and it's not like an evil thing like i'm doing this to, to just be mean he's like oh i they need i'm just giving it is done out of like bitterness for god but it's like he's just giving them knowledge and nothing more right so it's not like it but like of course lucifer is like the villain of christianity but it's it's all about perspective right it's all about perspective. Well, do you know about the gnostic interpretation of the garden of eden you should totally tell me about it <laughs> it's, well, it's just what you said. Um, I mean, you don't even have to change the story. Just read it right out of the Bible. The tree is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lucifer, the snake, or at least the snake, which is associated with Lucifer. There's some debate about that. But the snake tells them you will become like gods if you eat the fruit. And that's essentially true. Like if uh, if somebody can't conceive of good and evil then they're in almost like an animal-like state where they don't even understand right and wrong. Yes. And when they gain the knowledge of good and evil, they are expanding their consciousness. And so they are becoming closer to God in that sense. So the Gnostics, they think Jehovah is an evil God. And they think that the snake was basically trying to help mankind by giving mankind the ability to see good and evil. And Jehovah is evil specifically because he wanted to trap man in that unenlightened state oh my okay I, I i absolutely love that and i don't want to get too crazy into the biblical stuff <laughs> but like um i, I do, an, welcome I to really the gnostic like, church quinn yeah because because it's it's like um i'm just gonna say it's one thing and then, and then i don't want to talk about the bible anymore but like so you, so you have uh yahweh like jehovah right who is this omnipotent omniscient being that creates creatures that he knows in the future will fail him and he doesn't give them knowledge of good and evil so how they can they don't even know what's right and what's wrong so how 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 are they being punished for not knowing you know what i'm saying how are they being punished it's for a not paradox. knowing no it's a paradox because the choice to eat of the fruit was disobeying god so if he had that choice then he already had the capability to choose evil so yeah it's a bit of a paradox but you know yeah. it's a parable so mm -hmm. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but talk away. Well, well, okay, but now look, it's it actually this this Garden of Eden idea is being used in a Song of Ice and Fire all over the place. It is. I mean, that's what the weirwood is. It's the well, tree well, of knowledge that makes men become like gods when they eat of it, and eating the tree uh, of knowledge that's the same as trying to steal the fire of the gods, like Prometheus does, and that's why I keep saying. Lightbringer represents the fire of the gods and the burning the weirwood as a symbolic burning tree like the burning bush of Moses is is equivalent to Lightbringer the burning sword they're just two different symbols if you will classic mythological symbols of the power and the knowledge of the gods that man can sort of obtain so Lightbringer Azor Ahai do you think that prophecy, the Azor High prophecy, fits Daenerys. Well, of course it does. Mm -hmm. So, is Daenerys good or evil? No one's well, good or evil. No, well, I, I know that, but <laughs> what I mean is, is she whatever she is she gonna help defeat the others, or is she going to, or did she help usher the others in? Well, see, that's the thing. Uh, I'm not. I'm not entirely certain that it's about defeating the others, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as much as it's about just um, kind of just maintaining the balance. Coexisting. So yeah, coexisting exactly. Like, and as far as like um, good or bad, good or evil, like we were talking about the Star of Wisdom, and then we were talking about the potential for there to be other organizations. Neither of these organizations has to be good or evil. They just simply are doing what they're doing they have they might have different ways about trying to accomplish the same things right you can accomplish the same thing let's say like um you're, you want to do something whatever it is 
but there's a guy in your way. You can either walk around him or you can shoot him in the back of the head, right? But it's really just like, it's really like two different ways of accomplishing uh, the Or same you could thing. like tap him on the shoulder and be like, hey man, would you mind yeah. stepping? <laughs> I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, that's just me, but you know. <laughs> yeah. You can shoot ah. him in the head if you want to, Quinn. I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't shoot him in the head. <laughs> no. But. Well, basically, why I ask because LML, your name, your 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 handle is Lucifer means light bringer. I don't look Here's at Lucifer. My Here's my spell. <laughs> I don't look at Lucifer as a good person. I and the more I research and look into Azor High. I don't think Azor High is a good person. Well, they, that's kind of the, the heart of it. Like, let's uh, set the Lucifer stuff aside in this for a second. Just consider Azor High. What do we know about him? He killed, his... His, he killed his wife. Okay? Yeah. He works blood magic, which we're told is an abomination. Um, he, quote unquote, left a crack across the face of the moon. And if I'm right about cracking the moon being the cause of the long night, then Azor High might have been the guy that quote unquote caused the Long Night, which is one reason why I think he's actually the Bloodstone Emperor. Mm -hmm. Because the Bloodstone Emperor is remember as causing the Long Night. Uh, and I think that black meteor that the Bloodstone Emperor worshiped is actually the thing that Azor High made Lightbringer out of. And so that, what he was doing was like all dark magic, but uh, putting my theorizing aside, just right there in the myth, I mean, the guy stabbed his wife. That should be a red flag. And that's exactly what it is to Davos, who's kind of like the conscience of the story, I think. You know, people like Davos and Sam and John yeah. to an extent. Um, so Davos, and uh, I would say uh, Sansa too, but uh, in any case, um, Davos, you know, he's like, wow, I couldn't stab my wife, you know, even if the world depended on it. I guess I'm not a hero, but that's actually totally ironic because, of course, Davos is a hero precisely because he would not stab his wife no matter what. Right? Mm -hmm. so, exactly. exactly. So I don't I don't think Azor High was necessarily a good guy, quote unquote. But you know how Martin likes those conflicted things. So like, you know, somehow he caused the long night. It might have been an accident. He might not have been trying to cause the light long night. He might have been trying to do something else. And that happened accidentally. Or maybe he caused the long night, uh, but he also ended it. Or his son is the one that ended it. Uh, and so that's sort of like he's the cause and also the cure kind of thing. So he might still end up being the hero. And I do think we had a flaming sword hero that fought on the side of the living, too. So that's not like totally a lie. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, the guy stabbed his wife. Come on. We have to question if he's a good guy. Well, the White Walkers could be seen as having flaming swords because I think in the prologue, it's called a pale, a pale sword. Pale sword, it's alive with moonlight, which kind of makes you think of dawn a little bit. Maybe they'll be fighting each other with pale swords. I don't know. But basically what, what we were getting at was that the um, Valerians are from the great empire of the dawn. And, and from a shy, like most importantly, like that's why I was saying like the great empire of the dawn is like filling out that theory with more detail. But we mm -hmm. always knew dragons came from a shy. Well, I think I think it means a lot of different things. For me, like you just said, that magic was an abomination, or not magic was an abomination, but blood magic is an abomination. Yeah, uh, they call um, the Dothraki call it an abomination, and um, who's the the God, the who makes Ky uh, Kyburn? Kyburn says uh, blood magic is the darkest kind of sorcery, but also the most powerful. But all the magic that we have seen so far all is all blood magic. And it's, I don't... All, it's all rooted in fire and blood. All of it. Well, no, skin changing isn't. Well, the trees... You, well, I think that the green seers need blood sacrifice in order to be pow more powerful. Yeah. Yes, that could be true, yeah. But and look, I look at the dragon glass that they used allegedly, not book well, cannon, but so all Valerian magic is rooted in fire and blood. That's the quote from Marwen. Yes. Um, separately, 
what you're saying is also potentially true that it all boils down to blood magic on some level yeah that, that i've heard people say that too yeah because melisandre she uses the fire to see visions and then she burns people alive which is blood sacrifice with fire she, she bleeds when she sees her visions too i, ha I have a note about magic I, I don't necessarily buy that any magic is necessarily dark or light magic right I feel like uh, perhaps certain types of magic are considered widely to be abominations, maybe perhaps because those certain types are more volatile than others. They go wrong more often perhaps, so people just kind of know to stay away from them. Because to say that a certain magic is dark and a certain magic is light implies that there's something that's inherently good and inherently evil about the world, and I think that uh, things are much more complicated than that in, in A Song of Ice and Fire. I don't think there are forces of pure... I, I agree with malevolence. that. I agree with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. That's a good caveat. Yeah, so th that's kind of what I take away from it, is that everything, everywhere, is connected to this great empire, and that dragons, their self, were made... I think through magic and I think dragon riders like the people that actually have the blood of the dragon were kind of made like yeah. um, like, yeah. inter yeah. like reading we were just talking about this in yesterday I was about to say, I was I say you were going to like the episode me and Quinn just recorded <laughs> and I think like um, that's why some of the Targaryens have the babies with the I think we talked about this before yeah yeah, and, totally. and I was kind of thinking like maybe it was it had to do with those witches being around but then you were telling me that uh, Rhaenyra had a, mm -hmm. a a winged baby or scaly baby and I, I just think that like everything is connected like to everything well so the major clue that supports that theory is Melisandre claiming that the hinge of the world that is the wall made out of ice in the far north somehow makes her fire magic stronger and that is counterintuitive if magic was all separate like ice magic and fire magic had nothing to do with each other then a hinge of the world fashioned out of ice magic shouldn't make melisandre's magic stronger right but the right. fact that it does means that there's some underlying common magical energy that probably can just take the form i look at the the elements as the the way that people interface with the magic. Like Melisandre has trained to use fire to interface with magic. So she probably couldn't use a different form, but yeah. somebody else might be able to learn to use ice. And I think that's what Night's Queen was, is like an ice sorceress, kind of an analog to Melisandre that learned how to use magic via ice. But it's the same magic at the core probably, right? Right, because yeah. I look at ice as frozen fire like dragon glass they call it frozen fire so that's kind of how i look at ice i don't look at it as like a yin and yang thing even though i think that's what it's meant to be looked at oh, like man. i don't look at it like that i look at it like it's all one thing they're all drawing from one source for everything so you <laughs> just you just started uh, my moons of ice and fire series right yeah. Okay, cool. So when you get to the RLJ episode, which is number five, I talk about that whole frozen fire thing. And so it's actually what George is doing is he's recreating yin and yang down to the finest detail. Because if you look at yin and yang, it's not just the black half and the white half. The white half has a black dot in it. And the yes. black side has a white dot. And that is there because there is no such thing as purity and everything has an element of its opposite within it. And that's also why the dividing line isn't a straight line. It's a bendy S line because each side flows into the other one. And so they're telling you that yin and yang are inseparable. You, there is no purity of yin or purity of yang. That's like baked into it. And so what George has shown us is yeah, ice and fire, but fire has an element of ice because it can be frozen. That's frozen fire. But frozen mm -hmm. fire is still playing on quote team fire because it kills the others. It's got the essence of fire magic frozen into it. And then if you look at the others, their ice burns, right? 
it's mm -hmm. like blue stars and yes. they keep saying nothing burns like the cold and their eyes burn like cold stars and so there's this whole idea about cold burning and cold fire and then the show even went further and gave us you know viserion and <laughs> and so basically he's showing us that ice can be fiery and fire can be frozen and so it's like a twist and a a further layer to the binary of yin and yang yeah that that's how i look at it and you you describe it a lot more eloquent <laughs> eloquently but well, that's it's just a Taoism. so I, I knew i knew you'd enjoy it um i stumbled i you know i learned it researching it so i'm i'm like no expert or anything but it's very cool and george seems to understand it really well and to have put it in the story so now that we know the origin of where we think the Valerians come from and Daenerys' ancestors, we want to talk about Valeria a little bit. Shame. 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 